Hello, everyone. We are very happy to have you here for Lazy Talk Brussels. And uh, today uh, we are hosting very interesting panelists and uh, the subject, the subject that we will talk about, this is Earth. It's a sun and Earth, Earth and sun. So the soil pulsation occurring in the Earth's biosphere. And uh, we have uh, four panelists. It will be Pere Ivanova, Niki Asman, Jana Maneva, and Jasmina Matalenic. <laughs> and our always now for really just uh, our uh, moderator, our uh, also inspiring person for this later talk, Edith Dove, mm -hmm. who is the curator and historian of art. And so she will be with us, and I will give the floor to her now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alexander. But uh, Alexander is really, Alexander Dimitrieva is really the one who started this also. Um, she's just as inspiring. We like to give compliments to each other. Uh, so this is actually the, the tenth talk uh, in the series of Laser Talk to Brussels that we started in uh, 2021. Um, so, for those who don't know it, uh, Leonardo Art and Science uh, Organization started these laser talks. They take place all over the world. Uh, there's a dedicated website where you can find more information. And we were in 21 already very excited uh, to start uh, this all. Uh, and um, this year it has been uh, mainly Alexander, in fact, who has been uh, organizing and moderating and leading the, the talks because I was busy doing something else. Uh, but I'm, I'm really happy to be back for this season's talk, which is uh, really exciting because for the first time we got, uh, we were subsidized by the Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles, uh, which needs to be mentioned as well. Um, so we now get paid for our effort and we can pay our guests, which, which is really nice to do as well. Um, and as usually, Silent Media Art Laboratory and Leonardo are ongoing partners. So this is uh, live streamed and afterwards uh, the whole conversation can also be found back on uh, Alexandra's website and mine. Um, so as Alexander already indicated, tonight's subject is motivated actually by the artistic practice-based <coughs> PhD research in Echo of the Sun, conducted by Pepa Ivanova at Luca School of Arts and uh, Karel Leuven, in collaboration with the Royal Observatory of Belgium. Um, her supervisor is Dr. Esther van der Boy, who we were happy to um, <laughs> who we were happy to have in the laser talks in December 22. So it's it's kind of nice how things are connected and how. Uh, some of the former guests, like Elsa Mill, come, come back to, to visit the talks. Uh, but I like the dynamic of it all. Um, so, Pepa is an interdisciplinary artist. I will first introduce everyone to Roma, um, and researcher based in Brussels. Uh, her recent works question the epistemological values of numeric languages and their scientific and art translations. Fascinated by how to materialize temporality, she composes light and sound experiences. She constructs decaying installations as well as physical scenarios to interact with. Uh, and we, alongside her, so Nikki Asman, uh, who is an artist with a background in film and art in science, who provides artistic, scientific, and cinematographic knowledge in experiments that use physical and chemical processes such as turbulence and fluid dynamics. Topics that serve as a metaphor for the turbulent and fluid times in which we live. Uh, by implementing natural and optical phenomena, she creates visual compositions for a sensorial experience and often ephemeral macro universes. And then we have our scientists, uh, Jana Maneva, uh, a heliophysicist with experience in space weather forecasting, currently working at the technical support for space weather operations at the Royal Observatory of Belgium. 
uh, and you have taken an active part actually in the creation of the bonds installation by PEFA. And her input in the discussion tonight concerns the journey into the solar depth, giving an introduction of the physicality and behavior of the solar layers and plasma. That's correct. I'm not a specialist, I'm, I'm learning. This is one of the reasons why I like to be moderator of this talk, so that I learn. Yeah. Um, Dr. Jasmina Magdal Magdalenic yeah, uh, is a scientist in the field of plasma <coughs> astrophysics, at, also at the Royal Observ Observatory of Belgium, and an associate professor at Kaur Leuven at the Plasma Astrophysics Department. And her input in the discussion concerns the data and the analysis of the solar observation data and the methods of recognition and categorizing the different phenomena in the solar plasma. So, although the sun is not to be seen tonight, uh, <laughs> it will be the central subject in, in our talk. Uh, and while current research in art science focuses on uh, artificial intelligence, biomedia, and human caused environmental changes, this talk discusses the sun earth cohabitation. The research focuses on the physical processes of the sun captured by solar and earth observations, which become creative mediums in the conception of the artworks dedicated to the interaction of the two cosmic bodies. In the contextualization of this research, uh, PEPA examines the holistic sun-earth sun dynamics from the perspective of more than human theories. According to these, all biotic and abiotic factors on the Earth share equal importance and expand in an ecosystem with the cosmos. And in this context, I learned about Alexander Gisjevsky's holistic interaction of cosmic bodies, which is intriguing in itself, and Luciana Pagici's autopoetic agencies and algorithmic architecture in the dialogue between scientists and artists. We look at the Sun Earth interconnection found in frequencies and pulsating in planetary processes. So bridging to the artworks resulting from the research encompass various methods and media from fictional solar data drawings translated by scientists and mixed media installation touching on the solar surface to interface composing the incoming solar events into soundscapes and an installation summarizing the entirety of the visual light on the earth. So, paper, <laughs> I'm going to sit. Um, you will finish your PhD this year, oh, that's the idea. I hope in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. no pressure then. Uh, on your page of the <laughs> School of Arts, you state that you will not question our dependence on the sun, but how the advance of scientific methods brings detailed information relating to our interconnected existence. You clarify the sun-earth correlations by comparing bits with patterns within data observation, and you develop the performative installation to picture the entire image of light on Earth into a feedback loop of solar observations, recorded soundscapes, luminescent organisms on Earth, and artificial light sources. So the floor is for you to explain all of this in more or less 10 minutes. <laughs> so in 10 minutes I have to explain all that. No. No. <laughs> well, um, I would love to uh, just touch on some of the yeah. <laughs> all of these things, and I will be happy that um, I think naturally there will be um, relation for all of these things we just mentioned with the, even the scientific research and the research thinking. Even though my research already discussed uh, this subject, I will just talk about three works. Yeah. That's uh, how I calculated. Maybe in ten minutes I can fit in, and. Uh, and just touch on the concepts, not go so much in depth, and maybe during discussions we should go further than mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you all for uh, joining uh, in Tuesday evening, this beautiful Saturday. <laughs> so um, the image you see behind me is um, a picture which was given to me by a friend of mine who lives in Stamstone. And before I even started the research, on the sunlight cohabitation, which I've been doing for the last four years. I was interested in the, sun, the, the, the light as a medium. So that was also something uh, maybe not so smart to do if you're an artist, like because it's more energy consuming and they're more prone to failure, but it's much more interesting and has this texture. It's um, there's a textile filter so that is like 3D printed pixels, but of course only people which um, are really interested in 
and that would um, notice it. So for me, even the LED screens were important that they are self-made, that we made them. And then we go into the research. Um, so Chizewski, how I came to Chizewski, I think it was many years ago. Um, I have no idea who, who initially told me about him. And it took me a few months to find the book and I found a translation to Bulgarian of, of one of the books, which was called The Earth, uh, uh, the, the Earth Echoes of the Solar Storms, which he published first uh, the first time he published this was 1936. So that was this amazing Russian scientist in the beginning of last century who had this holistic idea that the Earth and the Sun are interconnected. So, in, and my idea about the light was kind of like zooming out from the atmosphere, going closer to the Sun. I was like, what is the Sun? What are the structures from the Sun? What are the data of the Sun? What are the languages that scientists use? And I had like uh, meetings with uh, Jana, at meetings with Jasmina, with Christophe, uh, this scientist from the observatory in Belgium, with Stefan Putz, uh, about um, what, what are the interesting things, what I can make something out, and how I can um, sense, sense the sun. And I was happy to, to figure out that scientists have been busy with that long ago, and uh, especially the work of Chizewski, I was interested because he had this crazy idea that we're all interconnected and we live in this kind of a post-humanist uh, kind of society today that we already know that and we're busy with um, how the humans are not the most important, that we are all in a strong um, relations and symbiosis between all of us and we live in a fragile ecosystem and th that's why it, the feeling of importance of non-human beings became somehow more tangible. And he had this idea already um, last, last century. So in order to build his concept of how the sun and earth are in interconnected, he started collecting all kinds of data. He was himself, the, he was even called the, 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 the Leonardo of, of Russia because he, he was a doctor, he was a poet, he was an astrophysicist, he even uh, contributes strongly to the uh, solar cycle research, which is uh, well acknowledged in science. So he was this kind of a, a persona who uh, like strong interest in many things. And he started collecting all this data about abiotic factors, about biotic factors, about, like, and then he was comparing the, the solar cycles with the uh, events happening on Earth. But like from microbiological kind of organisms and, and things to, to to global um, historical events like uh, epidemics or um, wars or uh, revolutions. Uh, but also fertility, maternity leaves, uh, the amount of uh, um, blooms blossoming <coughs> in certain area, like it, it's crazy. And therefore, because he actually compared all these different types of data and he was trying to make a relation between things uh, like which seem completely impossible to be related a lot of his research be considered like biased, which is understandable. But I, I found recently a lot of a lot of uh, con contemporary research which proves certain in certain direction how uh, the solar cycles really enters, for instance, um, um, it's it's research more for instance people with cardiac arrest or like uh, heart heart problems. Um, the solar storms influence uh, their recoveries, um, and there's there's a lot in contemporary science start like being present on on his research. But like um, I found it a bit crazy that this artistic idea that I would compare all the data, I would cr create all these graphs. And I'll see what I can do. Even like for the for the fact that he linked the solar cycles with uh, the appearance of um, revolutions on the Earth, especially in Russia, he was he was sent uh, in prison. He didn't want to get out of prison because I, he wanted to finish his research on on the book. And he's like, can I stay a few more months? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, he was busy. So um, can you can you? Start to round off. Yes, yeah. this is the last uh, thing I will talk about. Okay, good. 
So, and this is the um, current uh, installation. Just a moment when it smashes, you can even hear it. Some people start to go. That's so cool. <laughs> so here, actually, as a, as a means of an accident, during a heat wave, the soap room was not working because it works best when the temperature of 18 degrees. So I had to think of something to make it work, and uh, I managed. <laughs> and then uh, I, I, the recipe uh, uh, got better, and I started to get these turbulent patterns. Uh, and I decided to make a, a second installation with it called Solaris. So all the works uh, about this have the word sol in it, which is a reference to the sun. And maybe to explain because it's the theme of the night. Uh, when I first started to experiment with uh, soap film or soap bubbles, actually, there was a moment I made an installation that I could stand in the soap bubble, and there was a moment that uh, the sun hit the soap film, and then I saw the reflection. And then I thought, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, as a means, after I started to always approach uh, the, the the light. Later, I found out that. Um, they were actually designed by somebody that uh, built them for my uh, degree, so in the Netherlands. And so when I was uh, making recordings there, it would it would it was too strong, so it would feedback completely. But still, I got nice recordings. Um, yeah, and so uh, there was a lot of book uh, programs, which was super nice and very fitting to the colors of the soap <laughs> And in the second part of the, 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 the residency, it became minus 25 degrees, which was already enough for the freezing of the soap. <laughs> so the colors are a bit different uh, in real life. So this is really much a bit saturated. But uh, the first half of the film is when it's minus 12 degrees and the soap becomes more viscosity, like a little syrupy. And the second part, it, it uh, crystallizes. And so, because it's very ephemeral, we, we, you can't bring it home. We made a film out of it and we made a composition for both sound and image. They're equally important. Uh, and so it's an 18 minute film. And what I like about it, and which is also something that recurs often, is that uh, scale. Is something that uh, uh, what, what I find interesting is that you have these, like this is like one centimeter by one centimeter, but it also reminds me of this uh, uh, this uh, constellation in a, in, a, in a cosmic constellation of the stars. And I like how you have these recurring patterns uh, that you have both on the micro, macro, and cosmic scale. So uh, another project I did with the sun was actually more literal and it's called The Abysses of the Scorching Sun. And it's basically uh, a machine that follows the sun. So it traces the sun throughout the day and uh, I can set it to the coordinates of that place where I show the machine. So it's basically a sculpture that is inside the gallery but uh, traces the sun that is outside uh, the gallery. And then it projects uh, this uh, image. Uh, so it's basically a custom built projector. So you have the light source, lenses, uh, uh, the color wheels, uh, and uh, mirror cones. And then again, it's pointed again uh, uh, towards the wall. And so each of them have their own cycle, just like uh, the planets. And, uh, and so this for me, was a project that uh, came about after the extensive research and thinking about uh, climate change. So I did. I was part of this uh, research project called Dark Ecology, uh, which was also up north, and it was about uh, uh, basically climate change and 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 where we are going with this. And uh, it was both in Russia and in Norway, and the contrast between the two of them was. These are, well, they were only like half an hour apart. So this is the nickel factory in Russia. Um, and so that le uh, led me to do research. People spoke there at like Timothy Morton and I read uh, research mm -hmm. of uh, James Lovelock, uh, uh, which basically it all led to this <laughs> giant depression of realizing, okay, we are going in the wrong direction. And uh, 
I think uh, the work uh, was for me a way to deal with these feelings of anxiety and, and also a uh, feeling of what can you do or can you do something. And I think uh, the work, um, so I started to think about time and basically by zooming out and looking at time from a cosmic, cosmic scale, then uh, it put things for me into perspective. Like we are only here for a small period of time. Um, these perpetual mobiles like the sun and the earth, they're not really perpetual mobiles, but they're quite uh, close. <laughs> um, so it, uh, it, it's, it's a piece about all these different uh, cycles and planets that have their own uh, time and uh, 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 existence in this cosmic universe. So this is part of pictures of uh, the research that I did and I was inspired by um, uh, also this work I really like sometimes mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. Nancy Holt. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an earth work from the 70s and she made mm -hmm. it that it aligns with the sun on the solar basis. <coughs> um, and there's even more to it, but it's a very uh, nice way of uh, being connected to <coughs> how the sun works uh, um, uh, on a very bodily uh, uh, way, and I think for me also the installation that that I made, uh, uh, like I sort of now more understand intuitively how the sun works and also in different places, and which sounds weird, but it does. It does uh, give you this knowledge. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've shown it on. Uh, several so, okay. it works really well at churches, all churches. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this composition of sound was made uh, by another artist who was travels, and uh, it's, it's reminiscent of these old science fiction films, which was another influence uh, of the work. And so, I like how this work uh, it's a place where you can be with people and it's also for me how I dealt with these feelings of anxiety about climate change was also by sharing these feelings in this work and sharing this uh, by being together by being entangled in this space uh, yeah. thanks yeah great thank you um, really great stories do the wonderful discovery of your work and of papers of course as well. Uh, we could now hop over to the scientific, uh, starting with Jana Maneva. Um, you've actually taken an active part in, in the installation walks by Pepe. And can you tell us a bit about this collaboration and how you can have access to the solar depth? And then uh, this transport actually they're related to things called active regions. So they are, they are very related. And these active regions are important to us because they produce some of the solar activity that's actually driving a lot of the processes that, I mean, events uh, that are reaching us on Earth. So these active regions, for example, are responsible for so-called flares. So these kind of images here. So this flaring is related to the active regions. Um, and the flares, you know, they can be seen as like a, very impulsive outburst of radiation. So the radiation from the players reaches us very quickly, as we saw, eight minutes, more or less. Uh, but why is it important? I mean, it's very beautiful to see it, but why is it important on Earth? Well, it's important because uh, <coughs> if this radiation, like if this player has certain intensity, then it can actually jam our radial, uh, you know, it can cause like real, some real impact. Uh, for us and our activities, mm -hmm. so it's important. And then we have like different uh, things, like we have the chromosphere, photosphere, so it's like very dynamic things. But we also have, it's a very zoo of effects on the sun, and <laughs> it's not trivial to summarize them, but we have certain things like what you'll see here, sometimes we, we see some darker um, areas on the sun, well, if you look at them in the corona, because after the, the atmosphere, the uppermost part of the atmosphere is called uh, so-called corona, solar corona. And surprisingly, it's actually rather hot, because there's this, this thing called transition region, where instead of the temperature dropping, dropping, dropping as you go out from the core, mm -hmm. then at some point, 
there is a jump like two orders of magnitude and all of a sudden the corona is very hot. The so corona is much hotter than the uh, inner atmospheric layer. So this is still like something that's worth ongoing investigations. But either way, so in the corona, we have these things called coronal holes. And um, they are also like one one of the in a way one of the drivers for space weather events. It's um, you would we would see it in a little bit. And then we have like prominences and other things. Why is the prominence here interesting or nice? Well, uh, sometimes all these prominence you see like are some plasma that is like from the lower atmosphere and it's visible uh, higher up in the corona. But sometimes uh, it can twist, so the plasma normally sits on something that we call magnetic loops and it's tied to the magnetic field on the sun. Mm -hmm. And then these magnetic fields sometimes they twist, and when they twist too much, it's a little bit like the spring. So they can twist, twist, and at some point they, they kind of, there's an outburst, so they break, they break out. And so when they, um, there is enough energy like to really for the spring that it cannot hold its uh, state anymore, so it needs to release that. Uh, and then what happens is that a lot of the mass is released together. Mm -hmm. So the sun, yeah, there is like um, an eruption that uh, leads to really the sun losing some of some of its uh, atmosphere, like some of the, some of the mass goes out, and this is what we call corona mass ejection normally. So prominences uh, are one of the sources for corona mass ejections. Um, and sometimes players also can be related to corona mass ejections. Okay, so we will come back to, to this a little bit uh, in a little bit, but now that we've seen some basic things about it, let's see like how do we know these things about the sun, right? So it's interesting, how do we, how do we monitor the sun? So a way to monitor the sun, of course, we have different ways. So one is from space, so we have a lot of different spacecraft. And here, like, it's, um, well, it's not all the spacecraft that's out there, okay? So this is just one set of spacecraft that, uh, <coughs> and actually a lot of these ones here are really monitoring the sun and the solar wind, and a lot of them are used uh, for, for operational space weather, well, not for operational, for operational there are fewer that are used for operational activities, like, it's we always used for operational activities, uh, SOHO, which I don't see, stereo is used for operational activities, uh, PROBA2, so a subsection of this uh, spacecraft is really used for operational activities and the rest is used for scientific research. And you know, we need to complement like science and operations and impacts because as Peppa said, many things are interconnected. So we need uh, the synthesis of both like science and operations. So one way to, well, just to mention here, we have like this, the Proba2 that you see, uh, Proba2 satellite over there, it's, it's Belgian satellite, so it's very nice to know. And there is also already a planned launch of Proba3 that is going to be like the next uh, mission. It's going to be Belgium as well, so it's uh, uh, Belgium with some ESA also, like ESA support for the launch and some ESA funding. So it's uh, very nice to, to know that Belgium is heavily involved in, in these studies. Mm -hmm. And another way to study the sun and to look at it is from ground. And from ground, uh, this is far not extensive view. We have a lot of different observatories all over the world, okay? And uh, here I list just some of the solar observatories and on top of this, this is really too very, very limited view. But yet again, so you see that there are some large telescopes that look at different layers on the sun as well, so they help us uh, both scientifically and operationally to, to study the sun and also to look at the possible impacts uh, and what we would expect in terms of activity and in terms of uh, space weather. And again, one of them is in Luko, so it's actually a, a Royal Observatory. Uh, it's where I work, and this is the USAT. Uh, so we have like this team that are daily observing the sun, they do daily uh, observations. So here you see like uh, an example of the photosphere in white light. And here you see, I think it's uh, um, calcium, uh, uh, the calcium line. So you you see like how we, we look at the sun whenever the, there are no clouds, <laughs> whenever we can, so we, we do it daily. <laughs> uh, and it's also done in Belgium. 
so just uh, yes, just to let put give a flavor of the space water services we do at the Royal Secretary uh, about um, this uh, regional warning center. So the regional warning center is really uh, an international, uh, well, it's a national regional warning center, but it's part of an international uh, ISIS regional warning centers. And this one is located in the Royal Observatory, so it's part of the Royal Observatory. Uh, so some of it is, as I say, we do 24-7 uh, monitoring of the sun via different means. So either via the spacecraft that we already have in house, so Proba 2 or 3, or also we have solar orbiter as a complementary uh, tool, because it doesn't, it's not giving operational data every day, but it does give data every now and then, we can use whenever it's available. And we also, um, we also monitor like uh, other spacecraft that's really operational, like for example, we host uh, the data for the STO. Uh, so we are doing like some also data storage and, you know, like uh, providing it also to, to external work on certain extent. And the STO is really nice uh, in uh, spacecraft because uh, here you can see that it has a lot of different uh, uh, spectral lines in which it's observing, so it has different instruments, uh, and then it observes like the sun in the different layers. So here you can see, for example, the photosphere there, the chromosphere, so you can see the corona here, uh, and then, yeah, there are several um, filters for the corona, so to speak, so you can look at the corona in, in different uh, filters. And we can also retrieve some information about the magnetic fields on the solar surface, or at least on the visible side from the Earth. So this this is like all information that we are using on daily basis to, to see something about the solar activity. Mm -hmm. Because as I told you, the plasma on the sun and uh, magnetic fields are um, very interconnected, and so they, there's a lot of interaction between them. So it's important to monitor both. As you would see on this image, I'm not sure if my pointer would go there, but like there are some, some spotted areas in the magnetogram, so it tells us something about the active regions as well. Yeah. So it's it's all connected. So if you will go to our website, uh, you will find a lot about these things, you know, like uh, we we do give some information about the ground <laughs> and we also have this radio measurements in plan that uh, I think yes, we will talk about uh, a bit later. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. And what I do, I'm like in this uh, space weather forecasting group. That's um, uh, well, it's space weather operation group that we do all the the forecasts, the alerting, and the, the support of different tools that help us ingest the data and monitor it uh, in in the means that we need. Now. So we also write these daily bulletins about the solar activity and the geomagnetic conditions and the solar wind activity, so you can read about it uh, and you can subscribe for it on our website, it's free for all, so you can just uh, subscribe. Speaking in terms of the sun and space weather and the operations we do, let's just say a little bit like why they are important. So I tried to sum it up at the beginning, but yeah, the sun is really the main driver of what we call the space weather. And what is the space weather? Well, it's, um, you know, all these different phenomena that you can have, like, so the drivers of space weather are either these CMEs, coronal mass ejections, or the flares. Uh, so they are like eruptions or the coronal poles that are the non eruptive drivers. But what the space weather can cause is problem with the communication, with either radio communication or navigation or satellite communication occasionally, and also causes like different various risks for aircraft safety or like the astronauts in the near Earth space that cannot get there, uh, on the International Space Station, for example. It also poses can pose risk um, to damage satellites. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's damaging satellites and sometimes it prevents satellites to lift up. Actually just uh, today I read another article because you know we had this uh, major geomagnetic storm we're having it, like had it this morning and I, I read an article that there was like again some trouble with the liftoff uh, so uh, there is like um, increased atmospheric track when with certain space weather conditions so it makes it harder for satellites to lift up or they need to adjust either just more I mean just to put more fuel to, to increase their trust or to do other things uh, to, to uh, correct for that. So sometimes yeah, there are cases which are known that satellites have been lost because uh, well, they had problems at launch 
or so sometimes electro electronics can stop working. Mm -hmm. This is really like a various input. And what's also we, uh, another effect that can happen is that um, certain like long pipelines on Earth um, can sometimes burn out during strong events, and so this is uh, something to be aware of. Uh, and so it can, like there, there have been cases of storms where, which have caused problems to the electric grid, like disruptions to the electric grid, uh, or like to long cable communications. Um, so this I wanted to show you like something when I was saying about all these various drivers of the space weather. So here is like a little bit of a sum up. So this here is the only non-eruptive driver of space weather. So these are the so-called coronal holes. The, you see these uh, dark areas, if you look at the corona and any of the coronal filters, you see these dark areas which we call the coronal holes. So they are um, believed to, to be the source of uh, fast solar wind, and this fast solar wind like, can actually uh, cause geomagnetic storms as well, and so it disturbs or like enhanced uh, particle precipitation, or, so it, it's uh, really one of the overlooked drivers. Of course, for big disruptions, uh, we, we most of the time we need like an eruptive event, uh, something like, let's see if this is going to play, Oops, sorry. No, it doesn't want to play today, so uh, I don't know if it's playing. Yeah. yeah, so this eruptive event, for example, this is, uh, the, you see the sun mm, in the center, it's actually supervision of different instruments that allows you to, to see it like this. Otherwise, the movie is uh, shown from different coronagraphs, so it shows you an example of how these uh, coronal mass ejections uh, look like, uh, you know, in planetary <coughs> space. So you can really see them. Oops. You can really see them with. Um, yeah, apologies for that. But you can really see the the particles as, as they um, move and propagate towards uh, the Earth or other planets. Yeah. And generally in the interplanetary space. Um, so some of the things that happen are, for example, we can have these radio blackouts. So they are related to these uh, impulsive events which are called pairs. Uh, and um, yeah, this is really like a, just a strong uh, outburst of uh, electromagnetic radiation. And you know, we have ways of like uh, seeing that. We have some ways of forecasting it to some extent. Uh, and uh, so we can forecast a little bit like, what would be the um, expected impacts. And we can have impacts on like the radio communications on other things. Uh, this is another example of space weather stuff. And this is with impacts uh, from radiation. And uh, radiation, as I told you, it can impact like spacecraft, but it can also impact like uh, flights. This is a new project that we are now looking at. It's really the impact of uh, Space weather related to increased radiation on, on flights of different routes and different locations. And also, it brings us like a more aurora, like to places where we don't expect it. So, it can be pleasant for the eye as well. Uh, all right. So, just to, to, before I finish, I wanted to, to say how it was working with Pepa and, uh, you know, how, trying to combine art and science. So uh, that's a great uh, challenge, and it's also like an eye opener. It's, it makes you like you know, um, yeah. It kind of opens up your horizons. So, for example, you try to represent like a certain um, phenomenon on the sun or certain layers of the solar atmosphere, and you want to make them in an artistic way. So you you, you tell an artist like, well, this is how more or less you know a filament would look like. And here is what you get. <laughs> so it's it's uh, it's an interesting view, but uh, you know it's rather it's rather uh, close, understandable. Or like, well, this is what we would like to have as the chromosphere, but uh, sometimes it's uh, you know it's slightly different. And yet that that's what makes uh, that's the beauty of art, right? Yeah. So that's really the beauty of art. Uh, now I should have put her very last picture here to see how lovely sunspots we have. But <laughs> okay, so this is a close-up example of a sunspot with uh, different structures inside. But this is taken from the ground, a very, very good resolution. And um, in space, we don't see them so well. But so here is what we you know, got in the art field. 
So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can find us online or just check our website. We hopefully have some time to ask you questions uh, after. Thank you very much. And then uh, we'll go quickly. I hope it's still okay for uh, for the length because there's so much to talk about. That it, it shows how rich the subject is. It's really fantastic. So Yasmina, um, how can we interpret solar observation data and which methods of recognition and categorizing the different phenomena in the solar uh, plasma are used? That was the question that I sort of set up. Maybe it's not exactly what you want to talk about, but so what I actually would like to talk about is what you want to do. Yeah, how you what how you observe because yes, what what intrigued me just now in in, in what uh, Nikki was saying is is and that's actually already one of the questions that I wanted to pose. So maybe you can because since when. Is the sun a subject? I guess in science, I guess from the very first moment, because it's such an important uh, presence for, for us. Uh, but for instance, when you showed the core, mm -hmm. I wondered how, how do you know that there's a core? Because you cannot really come close to the sun, I, I suppose. And the, the satellites, you, you showed an image of the satellite really close, but I guess that's impossible that it comes that close. Um, so, can you tell well, tell me from your point of view how you use the data, maybe? So, yeah, I mean, what we did with PEPA is uh, we worked on the radio observations. Yeah. So what is for, for me and what in general the radio observations are, like if you imagine you, you want to paint a picture yeah. and you have, want to have a nice picture, then you really need to have a lot of colors. Mm -hmm. If you use only black, you will see only certain things. Yeah. You cannot make the face ash with a black hole. Mm -hmm. So you need the red and green and blue mm -hmm. and yellow. Mm -hmm. The same way is like in the solar physics, what uh, Jana was showing, she was showing different wavelengths. Yeah. How we see the sun on different wavelengths. And uh, each of the wavelengths gives a certain information about the sun. Mm -hmm. The same way as the radio gives a certain information about the sun, maybe about the hidden carrier and the layers of the sun, just to say you know, before I started my presentation, is like if you're looking at the certain uh, uh, frequencies uh, and wavelengths, then you, you see the different temperatures. Mm -hmm. And with using these different temperatures, you can actually understand them how the, the sun is, is, is made, how, the, oh, yeah, okay. how the, uh, the basically plasma, because sun is a big ball of plasma, which means it's uh, like quasi-neutral, uh, uh, um, quasi-neutral mixture of particles. Mm -hmm. So how, how actually they feel, follow the field lines, because everything which is uh, on the sun go, uh, is guided by one single thing, and that is magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So magnetic field of the sun is the main player there. So the plasma follows the magnetic field line. As the magnetic field line is becoming more twisted, you have this uh, sunspot which I'm merging, which Yana was showing, which I'm merging on the solar surface, and which caused the solar activity. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to show is how the solar radio observations and what part of the picture the radio observations actually mm -hmm. So what we see here is the, the, the solar array, which is presently not fully in use. This is our domain, uh, solar array, which was uh, in uh, 1936 uh, um, or something like that. It was the biggest array in the world when it was made. Unfortunately, it was not working too long, and now we are trying to refurbish it. Now we are having our own observations in our course. So what you see here is one so-called dynamic radio spectrum, and which shows the intensity of the radio emission. Different colors means different intensities, and this is what we worked with Peppa. So she brought a, a nice collage of, of colorful paintings. And then I said, okay, let's see what kind of a solar radio emission I see in these paintings. Mm. And that seems what we did. Unfortunately, I have no paintings here. But, yeah, I had like one slide I had to show that before you have to yeah. yeah. So as I was saying, as, as the radio observations are only one part of the full spectrum, so of the uh, full uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, 
of the sun, which we can see from the sun. And we see that this is the blue, is the, the part of the, the wavelengths uh, which are covered uh, in the radio observations from the, uh, from the Earth and from the space which we have of the sun. And of course, we have all, uh, the, all different uh, energies which, as we are going to the uh, shorter wavelengths, we are also going to the, the higher energies. So we, we see that actually the radio waves are going to uh, rather small energies comparing to other type of emission from the sun, but they are very, very important. So uh, as we are going away from the sun, everything which we observe in different frequencies, uh, uh, because the frequency is mapping the, the density of the plasma, and the plasma is decreasing as we go away from the sun, this is how also the frequency is decreasing at the wavelength, because they are uh, pro uh, 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 anti-proportional, the wavelength is changing in different ways. So they, their frequency is decreasing, but the wavelength is increasing, just small. So how do we see the, the radio emission from the sun? What we see here is that this is the, the, the in the, the y-axis is the frequency, and the, in the x-axis is the time, which shows this is the so-called dynamic spectrum. And it shows when we are going, as the arrow shows, the frequency is decreasing, which means everything which goes up goes away from the sun. So we, we see that this, this dark thing, these are so called dark sphere radio bursts, they're going away from the sun. And the steeper it goes, which means they need less time because we have the, the, the uh, x axis is the time scale. So they are going very, very fast away from the sun. While these things, the, the more, uh, the, the more uh, less steep, the more uh, slowly going away from the sun, that's a so-called signature of the shock waves. Mm -hmm. And the shock waves are very important. So, as Jana was saying, during the, the, the solar activity, during the eruptive processes on the sun, there is a really a, a, the full spectrum of things which are happening. Plasma is being heated. Plasma is ejected from the sun. The shock waves and particles are being, being accelerated. And there, as you see here in this small sketch, I'm not going into the details. So there is a, a, this is a kind of a model how the, the eruption happens. So the, the, the field lines go up, and in certain moments that it comes to the, the, the so-called reconnection, and then the things wrapped above and we have the post eruptive loops which stay on the bottom and they are very bright as Jana was showing because there is a lot of plasma in them because there is a lot of heat which is emanating. If we would manage to get the energy which is released during one of the middle of the flares we would have energy that we have for the whole earth for years. Mm -hmm. So that is the amount of the energy which is being released from the sun. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we were looking at the different uh, uh, paintings of, of Pepper, we, we saw also different type of bursts. Uh, you asked when we started to see the sun with the, the solar radio physics is very old. It's still from the 60s, from, from the last century, mm -hmm. which means we have like 80, 90 years uh, of the observations. And that were one of the first observations of the sun because they are possible to be made from the ground. So the first radio telescopes were already mapping the radio signatures uh, of the sun. And uh, uh, this is why the, we have, as they were finding different type of the radio emission, they were naming them, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4. And all these different types, they are related with the different, different processes. For example, type 1 emission is related with the small reconnection processes and small turbulent things which happens above the active regions, a strong magnetic field and a lot of different things of everything plasma is mixing because one, what sun is not, it's not static. Everything moves there for mm -hmm. always on the different scales, on the small scales, on the big scales, or big eruptions, everything is very dynamic. So then the other second type of, of the uh, mission which uh, the scientists managed to, to find more type twos which are associated with the shock waves. And that's a one for us, one of the most important, and for me, that are my really uh, my favorite type of radio emission. So, this is the emission which is associated uh, 
of the fast electrons which are uh, generating radio emission at the shock front. <coughs> As this shock front propagates following the radio emission, we can follow the shock wave. Mm -hmm. And what was Jana saying, we can actually forecast when the geomagnetic storm will arrive to the Earth using these radio observations. I will show this a little bit later. There are also the other kind, two types of the uh, radio bursts. So this is the kind of sketch of the coronal mass ejection. And the, the, I placed the different type of radio emissions of approximately where they appear. Uh, so the type three bursts, are, these are related with the fast, but very fast, the one third of the speed of light electrons, which, which move away along open or quasi-open field, uh, magnetic field lines from the sun, really very fast processes. And then we have type fours, which are directly re related, uh, like emission from the from the pores of the of the coronal mass ejections. How that looks like in our observations, and what we also see in Petra in in Pepa's, uh, 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 drawings. So we see first the, the little spotty things, the type ones, which are actually the emission which comes above the active regions. Really, because it's a lot of small things like everywhere. It, it's, it's really like a small sparkles, small radio sparkles. And then here, and this dynamic spectra, these are all the time dynamic spectra, like I've shown before. You have the fast, uh, very fast, uh, one third of the speed of light beams of electrons, which make the type 3 emission. Then the shock signatures, the type 2 emission, slowly, much more slowly drifting about let's say 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers per second velocity, so of these shots, and the, the type 4 emission which comes from the, the within the scene. So once the, the, the eruptive event happened, like, like Jana was saying before, thank you, Jana, for the introduction. <laughs> so it's much easier now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we want to understand when, when the, the arrival of the shock will be at the Earth. And what it will cause? It will cause beautiful auroras, which you can see. I'm very jealous. I've never seen them. Uh, so, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, it will cause beautiful auroras. So, this is one of the manifestation of arrival of disturbance to the Earth. And how we can use the radio observations? If we have ground-based observations, we can have a low coronal shocks. And we can, in order of 15 minutes, say, okay, we have a shock which, which is probably propagating towards the Earth because we see it from the visible side of the Sun. And then further on, the, this is always a question, is it a flare or the, or the coronal mass ejection we generated that shock? Because if it's a coronal mass ejection, the shock will propagate further away, and then it will be seen as this, this so-called interplanetary type to which I've shown before. So like continuation of the shock. So the shock goes, oh, it just comes by itself. Shock goes, the away from the sun, and as it goes, we map it. It's, it's like leaving the traces in, 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 the, in the snow. This is what the shock does for us, so we, we can understand how fast it goes. And then we can understand when we will see the auroras, and there is a, even, even the small program which is being made, which is for aurora hunters. Mm. So the people who, who will love to see auroras, they, they can understand how and when auroras will happen. So, and how, as I said before, the, the radio is only one, one pane uh, in, in order to make the full picture. So we have a big coronal mass ejections, which are here observed from two different viewing points. And then using this, we are able to reconstruct the, the 3D structure of this, this coronal mass ejection. And once we reconstruct it, we also can do that for the radio observations. As we see from the different spacecraft so we can understand exactly where the radio emission is propagated which is fascinating and now what, what we did in the, in this work is like we combine the two things we have the reconstructed the coronal mass ejection which is this viral thing and we also reconstructed the, the, the radio emission and once we put them together it's very clear where radio emission is coming from and how it is generated in this case, as we see, it's, this is the kind of a streamer region where are open field lines. In, in, uh, the, due, due to when the shock interacted with the streamer region, it caused the radio emission, which is very important because this means that the radio emission is coming from this part of the scene and not this part of the scene. So 
if it comes to the Earth and it makes aurora, it will come a bit later than we think. Because this is a, a more away from the sun than this region. So when we do the using radio observations for forecasting, we have to be careful because we have to know exactly where the radio emission is coming from. Of course, not only shock signatures can be mapped, but also the, the type three bursts can be mapped. This is the, the these bubbles show the, the how the type three radio emission propagates these very fast semi-relativistic electron beams which go away from the sun. And why they are important? Because they show the magnetic field configuration and they show how the Earth is connected with the magnetic field to the sun, which is extremely important because of this strong particle events, which Lana also mentioned earlier, which can cause uh, all kind of uh, disturbances in the, in, the solar, in the Earth atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And at the end, of course, as were all the paintings which, you know, which Peppa made, this is how the sun makes the paintings. Mm. So I have put here a number of different types of birds, so you can see how how differently they can look depending on the on the what sun makes from them, on through which environment they propagate, how fast they propagate. You see, here there are many lanes which show that this is the emission coming from a very short, very wide region on the shock, really in all directions. These ones are kind of more nice and more more narrow which means this is a specific region on the shock where the emission is coming from. So, sun never makes two of the same, like the artists. So sun is also a big artist. So, it's not possible to have two of the same ones. So, what we need to do, we need to use our imagination. So, we have to be a little bit artistic also in order to be able to recognize what we see on this dynamic spectra, what we see from the radio observation. And then, once again, um, this is something which I didn't talk about because the time is limited, of course. What you see here is, is like uh, the emission from the type, type 3 burst, but also this is type 3 burst. And there is also a small, many, many small millisecond radio emission structures which talk about a so small fragmentation of, of, of the, the radio emission which is on the, such a small scales. And that we can see only now, because only now, uh, since last couple of years, we have also this. This is a LOFAR. I don't know how much you've heard about the LOFAR. LOFAR is a big telescope array, which uh, is in interferometer. What does it mean? It has a, a many stations along the whole Europe. The, the, the main station, so-called the, the, the the basic station is, is, is in Holland, uh, and uh, uh, then this is the, like, the, the, the core stations. And then there are stations which are on different places, some in France, some in Germany, some in Spain. There is one which is, which is uh, uh, on the very north, uh, and it's about like 1,500 kilometers away from the first station. So each of these stations connects, collects the solar signal, collects emission from the sun, <coughs> and then it makes this kind of art. So it's it's a really art. And if you look, more you zoom, so more you look into these small things, more you will see. It's like it never ends. It, it goes. Uh, it actually the only limitations is not the sun and the physical processes, but our ability to see the sun, which means the resolution of our instruments. So there is many more, which can, uh, more than we see, which some can be used for us. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I would like to ask some questions before giving the, the audience also the possibility to ask some questions. Um, first, I think that, that we have two artists that never do the same. Uh, I think in, in what you showed in your work with with the soap films or, or with your last installation, that there's also this variety in it and that there's a really nice interaction between what you they do as artists and you as scientists and, and what, what you just said shows as well the artistic part of science and the scientific part of artists, I think. Um, I understood that there's that there's a uh, um, solar cycle of 11 years, is yes. that right? Uh, so you said that they started more or less in the 50s, the 1950s, yeah. to, so 
And in that period, they discovered that there's a, cy a silver cycle of about 11 years. This was already known earlier. Yeah, that was no, earlier. No, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but, but the thing is that, you know, when you speak about so when did the research on the sun start, you go like the interest of the sun. Yeah. But this is before Christ. Before, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, this yeah. is our source of energy. Yeah, and yeah. So with the first eclipse, I guess, the people saw. Yeah, so they still would be already, like, whoa, yeah. what is that? What is causing it? So now, it's actually, so, so the, uh, because you talked about depression uh, in, in terms of, of the uh, climate change and so on. And uh, so there's also talk of the sun lighting. Uh, given the enormous measure of, of the sun, I doubt that that is for uh, no, no, no. very quick. No, no, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I think we will all yeah. die out before the sun. Yeah, sun it looks is, nice. if, you, <laughs> yeah. if you look at the, the age of the sun, the sun is like a teenager. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. I mean, you know, no, no, it's about half of its cycle, no, right? Because the kids are still teenagers. I'm not young, it's half of its cycle, and here it goes to the red giant. Yeah, yeah, and yes, then, yes, yes, yes. I think the red giant, but yeah. I mean, I wish. Yes, yeah. and, uh, no, I'm not directly worried, but, but, but uh, <laughs> are there more suns like this in, in the universe? Is that known? Well, uh, of course, yeah. Yeah. this is why we say uh, this sun. Yeah, when we speak in yeah but this, this size, sun, this size of sun. Of course, it's, yeah. a, it's a medium uh, star. Uh, star. Yeah. This and then the final question that I'm going to ask, and then I'll definitely give the word to the audience, or to Peppa, who is also keen to ask <laughs> <questions>. <laughs> um, I'm very guilty about some things so I want to fix it. Yeah, <laughs> the, um, the sound that you use in your installations, uh, Nikki, yes. uh, is that, do you make use of these radio waves or, or not at all? Yeah, the electromagnetic waves from the, 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 the listening to the yeah. Aurora Borealis with the VLF, yeah. uh, so the very low frequency antennas we used uh, for the sound score of the, 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 the film uh, that I showed, and, yeah. uh, but it's, also it's other recordings. Uh, so yeah. we. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so in that yeah. case we, uh, we... But you mix it a bit with the science fiction no, no, that's the other that's, installation. No, no, that's the other installation. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Not mix in the same installation, but yeah, you, you use both. So aspects. for that thing, so the video installation, liquid solid, we also used uh, singing of the wheels because uh, uh, we didn't make our own recordings, but we used the one that were used for the Voyager uh, yeah. uh, LP that was sent into space, and uh, um, yeah. Uh, it's 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 many recordings and uh, yeah yeah yeah. So we first let people fix a problem. And now maybe yeah. we can ask questions. <laughs> we can see that. But I wanted. I feel guilty because uh, so you want, and you, with Jasmine we collaborate particularly on one project, and I feel guilty because we didn't show uh, the, the. I didn't show the project. I'm very guilty. And also my summification is based on on that research, on, exactly on on the radio data. So uh, first, I'm going to show the drawings because it was kind of a collaboration between two of us. It's a it's a project we did together, and I have just uh, I'm just okay, briefly show just one image because um, I mean I, I get I assume most of your artists. So as artists, we know uh, our methods of working. So you remember from her uh, presentation uh, the radio. Uh, the data is usually in visually represented. So I kind of decided to make my own data, which I give to uh, Jasmina to translate for me. This is uh, like in a seal screen technique, where I'm just, with the squeegee, I smudged uh, stains of paint. In a way, they look like uh, spectrograms, but they're much different. Something what I do also with the uh, surfaces of uh, the sun and the, the plasma of the sun presented in glass. This is another way of translation, which is I make fictional um, solar data. Nice thing about this project is that Jasmina managed to find phenomena in these fictional uh, spectrographs, which are really graphical works. So there is a zebra patterns, there is a fibers. Mm -hmm. So this is radio fine structures. Super, super. This uh, is a type for continuum. Yeah. Yes, type four continuum burst, which she was. Is, is that your handwriting? Yes. Ah, yes. yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you really diagnosed this. Yeah, yeah. This, I, this they were giving me yeah. A, yeah. a bunch of uh, paintings, and I said, okay, yeah. and I just 
through it like pasta and yeah. then you're like, okay, yeah. I see this too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we share a uh, co-authorship on this work. Okay, okay. great. Okay. <laughs> well done. So, audience, any questions? Uh, I had a question. Um, I was wondering what is the impact of the geomagnetic storms of the electromagnetic activity of the sun on Earth? Not talking about the electronics, but on uh, bodies, uh, living organisms, mm -hmm. elements of the Earth, because we always talk about these electronics. But yeah, when we're in these very uh, strong storms, what is actually, what, how does it affect us? Or it's a, it's a very good question. Actually, there are a lot of, like, there is a lot of impact on the bio life as well. Um, I guess many of you are aware that, you know, for example, birds, they, they fly north and south. And <laughs> so they, they kind of have this intrinsic uh, uh, connection to magnetic field or sensors for the magnetic field. So whenever there is a strong geomagnetic storm, for example, it can influence their orientation. And same is true for many animals, actually. So there are a lot of animals that have this uh, uh, sensitivity to the magnetic field. So for them, it's important uh, for just for orientation, for the sense of direction. There's also a lot of minerals that would, you know, like different types of rocks and stuff like this. They would also be sensitive, so they would in, in really change properties. But yeah, for the bio life, at least for animals, for sure, this is true. Like they can get disoriented and like, go to the wrong place so uh, yeah instead of reaching a warmer climate they could go to a harsh conditions and it's not nice right so <laughs> yeah. that's also influenced by by the effects of the moon because i mean we also talk a lot about influences the by the moon so it's of course a moon. different kind of uh, the moon rather reflects the sun but, but still there's also an effect of the moon on, on what is happening on earth so yeah there how is. do they interact then of course, we have different effects in yeah. the human, and they, so, they are all playing, uh, playing yeah. a role. Yeah, uh, you know. So I mean, there are even some studies, like there have been certain studies trying to correlate. Uh, I mean, you know, some people, for example, say that they have headaches when there is a geomagnetic storm, or then there would could be like uh, some people try to correlate um, problems with uh, cardiovascular uh, systems, like you know, increased chance of heart attacks. Uh, so yeah, there are some in, in, studies like this. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them do show cor correlation, but of course it's limited data set, so it's impossible to say, okay, a healthy, strong organism would probably not not feel or not, not become sick from a strong geomagnetic storm. Uh, maybe someone with predisposed conditions could be a bit more sensitive and therefore there, there could be like a higher impact. So... But there yeah. was, I think in your presentation, a slide where there was an uh, image of an astronaut, yeah. and that they could have problems with nausea and, and lower blood uh, count or something? Uh, so I put there on the impact of the astronauts, particularly like from the radiation point of view, so oh, from yeah. the energetic particles, okay. and, yeah. and not so much from the magnetic fields. Okay, um, yeah. yeah. Because I heard also, I don't know if it's true, but maybe Peta knows this also, that there were more wars when the sun was active, like they looked back yeah, that's what Shevsky was actually oh, okay. kind of proving because he was comparing data um, from like revolutions appearing. He was mm -hmm. actually associating with high uh, solar activity, mm -hmm. but he really did like really in the cycles. He he, he needed like a long period. Like the method is called historiometry, mm -hmm. where you need like real data, uh, data in longer periods mm -hmm. to really compare if there is correlation. So let's say 150 years, and you know like how many wars in which kind of regions we have, and we compare it with the solar cycles. And the sun has like 11.2 uh, solar cycles, but it has also 50, 100 year cycles. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not only the most common 11.2. So there is uh, more cyc cycles which um, scientists are researching. Mm -hmm. And he had found correlations. But also he had found correlations between the, the uh, exposures, like epidemics, uh, like uh, with the plague, uh, with the cholera, and so on. Mm -hmm. He was researching also. But when I started reading, he was even comparing data of how, how many pregnancies there were <laughs> that year. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, like how much harvest they have collected. But of course, this also can be a 
due to other like uh, things which are happening on, our, on Earth, could be like I don't know a volcano explosion, mm -hmm. colder climate suddenly, and that would also it's it, some of the some of the things that don't have to be necessarily correlated to the sun, but maybe with activities on the climate of the Earth. I could say that sometimes you can have very good correlations for things that coexist, but not necessarily trigger each other or are not necessarily you know related. So I think some people have tried to make correlations between, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, saving uh, saving electricity and drinking out. <laughs> and mm -hmm. You can have a correlation, but it's not like... Uh, Correl correlation doesn't mean causation. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the point. The point, mm -hmm. the point is that we are talking about a very complex system and one-to-one -one correlation and one-to-one -one correspondence mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't work. So what is happening is that, like, a level of the solar activity influences the, the, uh, the Earth's magnetosphere, so it also causes the, the, the thinning or thickening of the different layers of the Earth's atmosphere, which is which can be instantaneously. But also, uh, which means that it influences the climate. So now you can say, okay, uh, you cannot say that, the, that there are more pregnant women because uh, of, of the sun's activity. And on the other hand, there is. Let's imagine that the winter was longer. There will be more pregnant women. So, so <laughs> and, the, and the climate is actually uh, related with the solar activity. Of course, we are people. We are also influencing very strongly on the climate yeah. ourselves. So there are different different correspondences. For example, there were more happier people during low level of activity. Can we say that? Mm, I don't know. Mm. Uh, probably not. But mm -hmm. you can say there was more light, there was more yeah. sunny days during that interval, and that is because the climate has changed. So, mm -hmm. so you see that there is no direct impact, mm -hmm. but it can be very indirect. Of course, in the history, there was also direct ones, very direct ones mm -hmm. for astrophysicists who did not forecast it well the, the total eclipse, and they were killed mm -hmm. from, from the kings and empires. Because they did not forecast it, because people, uh, they, they just, uh, they were afraid. It was so mystical, it was so strange. But suddenly everything becomes dark and animals become quiet as a night. And it's like everything changes. And, and people, when they didn't understand, especially not educated ones, uh, and uh, empires were often not educated, as we know. So they, they are afraid of unknown. And then when the astrophysicists were not able to properly predict the, the total eclipse, then they were killed simply. Mm -hmm. And there are many of the astrophysicists were, were actually finished on that. The way, dangerous yeah. occupation. The yes, dangerous, <laughs> dangerous <laughs> occupation. So yes. if you ask directly, I would say that's also quite direct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was the time they would say, like, because of that because of the stars being on that, I don't know what. We have more harvest or less harvest, and necessarily something mm -hmm. happened, and there's nothing to eat. So scientists, in, <laughs> in a prehistorical kind of uh, also dangerous, dangerous. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. But also there is another thing which which we can see. It's also yeah, like even if the animals are the mainly mostly visibly uh, uh, impacted by the level of solar activity, if you look, uh, for example, the 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 goats, I don't know. If English, I'm not sure, the, the rims of, of the tree. So the rims of the tree will also be differently spaced depending on the level of the solar activity. Mm. So I think I've read an article once from one of the study bodies, uh, yeah. violins yeah. were made yeah. from, from yeah. the wood where it was visible that it's very old wood from still the mound the minimum time. And they could see the, the, by, the, by the wood, the, the traces in the wood, that actually it comes from that time. And the violin was also better than any other. <laughs> <laughs> I guess more expensive. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. Yeah. There's a question in the back. Yeah. Two actually. Uh, yeah. yeah, you took you first. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for wonderful presentations. Uh, I have a question about cross sectoral collaboration because I do believe that there is a lot that science and artistry actually share, but I wonder how did you experience it? And was it easy to find a common language or were, were there misunderstandings? Like, how did this work? 
Yeah. <coughs> An interesting question because I, in 2010 or between 2007 and 2010, I worked on a project for the University of Leuven and, and uh, with a show that was uh, presented in Museum M. And that was also about the collaboration between artists and scientists. And there were some scientists that were a bit like, well, if the artist has a question, let them come to us. And others had more of a curiosity. And those collaborations were much more interesting if there was a curiosity from both sides in what the other was doing. So uh, the first scientist was a bit like, well, I'm the scientist. So I'm better than anyone else. And that, worked, that, that didn't really work. But yeah. I must say that I was very fascinated, for example, to listen to your talk, uh, Nikki, because I find that I used to work on turbulence. So this was my scientific work before. And I was doing these simulations that would represent like so closely, like, oh, you know what you are doing. So it's really the turbulence in a different setting, but it's turbulent and it looks so similar. And so I was like, wow, that's really amazing. Like how, how many similarities, or how, how many common things there are. And well, it could be just me, but I personally have true fascination for the fact that you are really reaching out to scientists as well and trying to unite, uh, I mean, to, to bring it to a broader audience, like uh, in a way, in a different scope to bring science to a broader audience and to, to place it somewhere in different settings on Earth, on the impact on, on you know, how we feel, how yeah. what we do. So to make it like very healthy, very easy to understand, uh, I, I do appreciate that a lot. And I also think that we don't have dedicated time on that. It's just that yeah. we are sometimes overly busy. We are yeah. so busy that it's difficult to struggle, like just coping with your current activities. And then um, it's yeah, it's going to be a little bit like it sounds bad, but you know, it's it's considered like well, you cannot do your job, so why? You are you looking like for a side side project? You know, mm. it's difficult. It's mm. difficult to balance. Mm. But but in in what you were just saying at the end, I, I think because it's uh, art and science were in the past much more closer. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes. And uh, what you were saying in, in in your presentation at the end, I, I felt that coming back, sort of like realizing that the images that you produce happen are in a way in artistic field as well. And it's also clear that quite a lot of scientists in the way that they look at their data quite often have a more or less, well, artistic quality, whether it's in in in, in a way of an intuit, intuition uh, that they use or th that quite often art and science are much more closer to each other than, than we think. In, in the way of how we deal with, uh, I mean, you you were saying, well, uh, an art we the sun will never reproduce the same image, but an artist basically never does that either. So uh, these images were never the same, which yeah. uh, which just mean I was presenting. So yeah. she was very familiar, like okay, this is always yeah. going to be a different one. Yeah. So uh, it's not true that uh, artists will always want to reproduce themselves. And also the turbulence, you would never get the same soap. Uh, no, no, never. No, no, that's also ongoing. There was a, one other question in the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation also. And it was very interesting actually to see how, um, when the scientists were doing their presentations, how through this kind of rigorous uh, observation, we come to understand uh, what we know uh, through the sun, about the sun, or the scientific knowledge of the sun, right? So it was very interesting to see how this kind of series of observations from afar gives us this knowledge of this very specific scientific knowledge, and then how, for example, in the artworks, some of that data was, was was coming through in the pieces, even if it's, for example, ultra low frequencies coming from some region. So I was actually just wondering for all of you whether it happens on occasion or often or at all to consider or to be inspired by or to even take into account more uh, like non scientific knowledge about the sun, like non modern ontologies or. Anything that's not a kind of scientific knowledge uh, about the sun. 
is that something that comes into your practices at all? <coughs> For me, uh, to be honest, I, 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 I don't approach it scientifically, I approach it uh, more in experimental or empirically by observing or by doing. And so I also don't uh, pretend that I'm doing something scientific. It's just that uh, it's an inspiration or usually I know like one thing about a certain phenomena or a thing and that I start to explore and work with. So I, I and, and so like also in Finland when we were doing all these experiments like why uh, is the color disappearing uh, uh, of, this, of the iridescent cell film at these certain temperatures? And then you start to think of your own uh, uh, hypothesis, how do you say, a theory of why this could be. But if it's true, I have no idea. It's just, so for me, it's, this is my way of working, like uh, by, uh, by doing experiments and just uh, seeing. That's very much like experimental science. <laughs> That's how we do it. <laughs> we observe, we observe, yeah, yeah, and try yeah. to yeah, yeah. come up with some understanding. Yeah. But yeah. maybe with the difference that for me the outcome doesn't have to be true. <laughs> it's like it doesn't have to be scientifically correct uh, or uh, yeah, a proven hypo hypothesis. Like you tell stories. Yeah, with me was uh, something I, I heard from all the scientists I worked with, like when I was reading about Zizewski, who wrote his books in the 30s, last century, he was talking about the, the sense of feeling he had. He didn't have the knowledge, he didn't have all the data. He said, I have this feeling that the sun and the earth are interconnected. And then he tried to see how, how this might be. But it was a feeling, so he was driven by that. So I, I found this similarity sometimes as an artist or, you know, just as a human being, we, we, we're driven by a feeling we have about something and then we see what comes out. I really think this also exists in science. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, maybe not so uh, uh, expected from many of you to hear, but yeah, many times we have like some gut feeling and it's like, oh, I can't think about it. Exactly, but that, that is what I just meant, where, where it comes really close to each other. Yeah, I yeah. think we need to stop here because you have one yeah, very, very simple, last question. Simple else. question. Yeah, the yeah. distance between the Earth and the Sun. Well, it changes over a year, probably, going on the Sun. Yeah. But mm -hmm. does it change over the centuries? Is it going further away? that's not on the on the scale that we would measure with uh, <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry else uh, so so let's let's if i can say maybe yeah still, it's we interesting still don't know but we have talked about the science and, and uh, i'm i'm really scientist i'm really believe i believe i i don't yeah. find uh, the maybe something too non scientific uh, yeah but what i always say to my students and what i sincerely believe is like if you have no imagination, you will not be good scientists. Oh, there you go. So, yeah, I think that's that's a wonderful thing to end with. So, uh, because, well, it's clear that this was a fantastic subject because normally our talks are an hour and a half. We've now been talking for about two hours and I'm, I'm sure we could go on, but you need to go home to finish your projects. I know that. So, thank you very much. And